You ever just catch yourself replaying that one moment, that breakup that blindsided you, that time you failed spectacularly in front of everyone, that trauma that shattered everything you thought you knew about safety? You're sitting in your car or lying in bed, and suddenly, boom, you're right back there. Heart pounding, palms sweating, as if it's happening all over again. Here's the wild part. Most people don't realize they're living as prisoners in their own minds, walking around carrying this invisible suitcase of pain, thinking that's just life now. But here's the thing. Your brain is literally wiring these memories differently than normal memories. And once you understand how that works, you'll never see your past the same way again. Let's talk about something you don't often hear, why certain memories cling to you like psychological superglue, while others just fade away naturally. Think about what you had for lunch three Tuesdays ago. Nothing, right? Your brain filed it away as unimportant. But that moment when someone said those cutting words to you five years ago? Crystal clear. Every detail. Here's what's actually happening. Your brain has a built-in survival system. When something threatens you, physically or emotionally, it stamps that memory with a giant red never forget label. The idea is to keep you safe by making sure you remember danger. But here's where it gets interesting. This protective mechanism can turn into a prison. Your brain doesn't just remember the event. It stores all the emotions, sensations, even smells from that moment. So when something triggers that memory, you don't just think about what happened, you re-experience it. Your nervous system floods with the same fight or flight chemicals as if the threat is happening right now. And that's when something incredible happens. Or rather, something devastating. You start organizing your entire life around avoiding anything that might trigger that memory. You shrink your world. You say no to opportunities. You push people away. All because a part of you is still frozen in that past moment, bracing for it to happen again. Now let me blow your mind with some recent brain research. Scientists put people with PTSD in brain scanners and asked them to recall their traumatic memories. You know what they found? The brain doesn't treat traumatic memories as regular memories, or perhaps even as memories at all. When you recall a normal sad memory, your hippocampus, that's your brain's filing cabinet, lights up like a Christmas tree. It's accessing the memory from the proper folder labeled things that happened in the past. But traumatic memories? The hippocampus barely activates. It's like the memory was never properly filed away. Instead, it exists in this raw, unprocessed state, full of emotion and vivid sensory details, but not labeled as something that happened long ago. This is why a flashback feels like time travel. Your brain isn't retrieving a story from the past, it's experiencing a present moment threat that never got properly cataloged as over. Think of it like this. Imagine your mind is like a library. Normal memories are books properly shelved in the autobiography section, but traumatic memories are like loose pages scattered on the floor. No organization, no context, just raw information that can blow around and hit you at any moment. Your brain's goal in healing is to pick up those scattered pages and file them properly, to transform them from a present moment crisis back into a past tense story. And here's the empowering part. Your brain absolutely can do this, but it usually needs some help. Most people think the solution is simple. Just don't think about it. Push it down. Distract yourself. Move on. But here's the cruel paradox. The more you try not to think about something, the more it dominates your thoughts. You know the pink elephant experiment, right? If I tell you, don't think of a pink elephant, what immediately pops into your head? A pink elephant. Traumatic memories work the same way. The harder you push them down, the more forcefully they resurface. Let's be honest. Avoidance might work for a few hours, maybe even a few days. But those memories are like a beach ball you're trying to hold underwater. Eventually, they're going to rocket to the surface with even more force. And while you're spending all this energy trying to avoid the memory, something else is happening. Your world is getting smaller. You stop going to places that might remind you. You avoid certain people, songs, smells. You might even turn to unhealthy coping mechanisms, substances, workaholism, perfectionism, anything to numb the pain. Studies show that people who continually avoid thoughts and reminders of their trauma actually end up with more PTSD and depression symptoms over time, not fewer. Here's what's wild. The people who gradually learn to face their painful memories tend to recover their sense of well-being and get their lives back. The only way out is through. So how do you actually get through? Let's start with the most accessible tool, changing the story your brain tells about what happened. Our memories aren't fixed snapshots of truth. Every time you recall a memory, you subtly alter it. Details get added or dropped. Perspectives shift. Memory is more like a story you rewrite in your mind each time you access it. You can harness this natural malleability. Instead of, I'm broken because of what happened to me, what if the story became, I survived something incredibly difficult, which proves I'm stronger than I knew. Instead of, it was all my fault, 
What if it became, I did the best I could with the information and resources I had at the time. This isn't toxic positivity or pretending trauma didn't hurt. It's about finding a more balanced, realistic narrative that doesn't sentence you to a lifetime of shame. Here's a simple exercise. Write down the negative belief your traumatic memory has created about you. Then ask yourself, would you say this to a friend who went through the same thing? Usually the answer is no. You'd be compassionate. You'd see their strength, not just their wounds. Try extending that same compassion to yourself. Now this next strategy might sound terrifying, but stay with me, because it's one of the most effective approaches we have. Instead of avoiding the memory, what if you gradually, safely approached it? This is called exposure therapy, and the research is incredible. Success rates for trauma recovery can be as high as 65 to 80% when people learn to face their memories in a controlled, therapeutic environment. Here's how it works. You don't just dive into the deep end, you start in the shallow water with a trained lifeguard. Maybe you begin by just writing a few sentences about what happened, or talking about it for five minutes with a therapist. Each time you approach the memory and nothing terrible happens in the present moment, your brain learns a crucial lesson. Remembering this is not actually dangerous. Over time, the physiological alarm bells, the racing heart, the panic, the sweating, start to quiet down. Your brain realizes it can handle the memory without going into full crisis mode. Think of it like exposing yourself to a small amount of a virus to build immunity. You're building psychological immunity to your own memories. Here's where neuroscience gets really fascinating. Scientists have discovered that every time you recall a memory, there's a window of opportunity to modify it before your brain stores it again. It's called memory reconsolidation. Think of a memory like a document on your computer. When you double-click to open it, you can edit the content. When you hit save, the changes take effect. Here's how you can use this. The next time that painful memory surfaces, don't fight it. Instead, deliberately recall it while simultaneously grounding yourself in safety. Feel your feet on the floor. Notice the temperature of the air on your skin. Look around and name five things you can see. Remind yourself, that was then. This is now. I am safe in this moment. By weaving elements of present moment safety into the memory recall, you're literally updating the file. You're teaching your brain to associate that memory with calm and control rather than terror. With repetition, the memory begins to lose its emotional charge. It transforms from a live wire that shocks you every time you touch it into just information. A story that happened to you but no longer defines you. When the past invades your present, one of your best defenses is to anchor yourself firmly in the now. Mindfulness isn't about emptying your mind or achieving some zen state. It's simpler than that. It's about noticing. This is a memory. It's here right now in my awareness, and it will pass. Instead of getting swept away by the mental movie of a past event, you learn to step back and observe it. Like watching clouds pass through the sky. You see them, you acknowledge them, but you don't have to follow them or fight them. Here's a practical technique, the 54321 grounding method. When a memory hijacks you, notice five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, one thing you can taste. This pulls your attention back to your physical environment and reminds your nervous system that you're safe in the present moment. Sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is get the memory out of your head and onto paper. Research shows that writing about traumatic experiences for just 15 to 20 minutes on a few occasions can produce significant improvements in both mental and physical health. How does this work? Writing helps you process and organize the chaotic tangle of emotions and sensations. It's like taking a tornado in your mind and laying it out in neat, manageable sentences. On paper, you can express feelings you might never say out loud. Rage, grief, terror, guilt, without fear of judgment. The page can absorb what your mind has been carrying. You might write a letter to your younger self. You might describe the event in the third person as if it happened to a character in a story. You might just free write your raw feelings. There's no wrong way as long as you feel safe doing it. Many people find that their narrative begins to shift as they write. From I'm powerless to I'm still here and here's what I learned. The memory transforms from a prison cell into a chapter in your larger story. Here's what might feel unbelievable right now, but I need you to hear this. Many people who once felt completely imprisoned by their memories don't just find freedom, they discover strength they never knew they had. Psychologists call it post-traumatic growth. It doesn't mean the trauma was good, it means humans have an astounding ability to derive wisdom and resilience from even the darkest experiences. Research shows that roughly half to two-thirds of trauma survivors report some form of positive psychological growth afterward. They often describe finding new possibilities they never would have pursued, forming deeper, more authentic relationships, discovering inner strength they didn't know existed, developing profound gratitude for life itself, 
experiencing shifts in their spiritual or philosophical perspective. The very memories that once held them hostage became, in time, a source of insight, a reminder of what they survived, an inspiration for what they could achieve. Their identity shifted from victim to survivor to something even beyond that. A mentor, a warrior, someone who could help others find their way out of the darkness. So where do you start? Here's your roadmap. First, choose one small way to face your memory instead of avoiding it. Maybe it's writing one paragraph about it. Maybe it's saying the words out loud to yourself in private. Start tiny. Second, practice grounding techniques daily, not just when you're triggered. Build your present moment muscle when you're calm so it's stronger when you need it. Third, challenge one negative belief your memory has created about you. Write it down, then write a more balanced truth next to it. Fourth, consider professional support. Therapists trained in trauma, using approaches like EMDR, CPT, or somatic therapy, can guide you through this process safely. You don't have to do this alone. Remember, healing isn't linear. There will be good days and setbacks. That's not failure, that's the natural rhythm of recovery. Your memories, even the darkest ones, are part of your story, but they don't get to write the ending. The past has shaped you, but it doesn't own you. Think of painful memories as chapters in your book of life. Yes, they've left marks, but the story isn't over. You're not defined by what happened to you. You're defined by how you choose to respond to it. Every time you practice these techniques, every reframe, every mindful breath, every moment you choose courage over avoidance, you're reclaiming a piece of your life from the past. The chains of memory begin to rust and fall away. That heavy suitcase of pain becomes lighter to carry, and one day, you might even set it down completely. Imagine a future where the memory that once paralyzed you has become just that. A memory, something that happened to the old you, from which the new you has grown wiser and stronger. That future isn't just possible, it's waiting for you. Your life is on the other side of your fear. New memories are waiting to be made, memories of freedom, empowerment, and joy. The door is open, it's time to walk through and reclaim your future. If this resonated with you, if you felt this in your chest, not just heard it with your ears, let me know in the comments. Sometimes just acknowledging this is me is the first step toward freedom. You've got this.